so far, we haven't been all that lucky, okay? So this is a graph from the Cato Institute, which basically shows that over several generations of students, um, through sweeping changes in pedagogy, through multiple technological revolutions, we have tripled adjusted for inflation, what we spend on students, and we've gotten no improvement at all. None, zero percent, that's, that's percentage change, nothing, okay? So there are two former presidents of, presidents of Harvard who have uh, said essentially the same thing at two different times, and what they said is, the reason there's so much knowledge at Harvard is because the freshmen bring so much and the seniors take so little away. <laughs> okay? Now, it's a joke, but like the best jokes, there's a point there, and that is, um, let's imagine that what's going on, let's, let's just float a hypothesis here, that what's going on in the school basically is you have some kids who come in and they're already prepared because what their parents have been doing and their outside experiences, and they're gonna succeed because they don't really need you to succeed. And the other kids who are coming in, the school is essentially having no effect on them. This is exactly the picture you'd expect to see. If you're not seeing a change in what's coming in, who's coming in, you're not gonna see a change in what's coming out if the schools aren't actually doing anything. So we have to actually, we have to seriously consider that as a hypothesis, that when schools are claiming, look at all the graduates we have who go on to great careers, it's like, yeah, they would have been if you had done nothing. You know, the null hypothesis is basically, you're not accomplishing anything. We're paying a lot for it, but maybe we're not really doing anything. And my point in all of this is, that the first thing we need to do before we worry about things like um, how should we do things or how should we pay for what we're gonna do is figure out, let's agree on what it is we're trying to do. And until we do that, we're basically just, you know, wasting time, effort, energy, and sort of destroying some lives in the process. And this is where school boards come in. So we go to the future of school boards, which I think is a key to everything. So here's one vision of the future. Okay, the state takes over more and more of school funding, and they attach more strings to that money, more mandates, here's what you have to do, here's how you have to do it. Um, a greater attachment to what I like to call the astrology model of education, which is where you look up the kid's birthday and go, oh, you were born on this date? You should be learning the Pythagorean theorem this week. Right? So if you see that in the newspaper, you'd be laughing and just thinking, <laughs> oh, it's really funny, but when they do it in schools, everybody's like, okay, I, I guess that's how we should be doing this. So they will attach more strings to the money, more mandates, more requirements, uh, slopping things onto the curriculum. Oh, well, it's, you know, here's new things that we think are necessary. Um, and that will provide the illusion of a local control, but it will completely destroy it. Um, we'll get new taxes and we'll spend a lot more money and, and basically keep doing what we've been doing and getting what we've been getting. And like the Red Queen, you know, this, in this model, you have to spend as fast as you can just to stay in place, right? This is Alice in Wonderland, which increasingly seems less like a children's tale and more like a prophecy. So here's the thing about being a school board member. You are, as a school board member, given conflicting orders by a number of different authorities. So one of the authorities, of course, is the state constitution. And this is what the state constitution says. In Article 83, which is the one that is, has been cited by the, Supreme, the state Supreme Court as the justification for everything that we're doing. Free and fair competition in the trades and industry is an inherent and essential right of the people and should be protected against all monopolies and conspiracies which tend to hinder or destroy it. That seems pretty straightforward, right? Um, the issue is, the state Supreme Court says exactly the opposite, that you as a school board member, your job is to help administer a monopoly that hinders or destroys free and fair competition in education. So when you're in this situation, you've got like, well, the document says that, but the person who happens to be reading it this year says that, which one should I follow? Right? And most people just brush that off, I think, and just go, well, whatever the courts say goes. Right? If, if they said this, then that's what it must mean. And even though anybody with a fifth grade education could read the original document and go, that's not what it says, we just say, okay. You know, if the court says green is blue this year, then that's fine. That's what, that's what it is. Um, but it gets better. Right? So this is what the, the state Supreme Court says in the Claremont decision about why 
there is a state responsibility to provide an education, right? It is to provide each educable child with an opportunity to acquire the knowledge and learning necessary to participate intelligently in the American political, economic, and social systems of free government. This is the reason for all this, right? And so if we're doing anything that can't be traced back to this reason, that's really suspect. So if we were going to agree on a goal, which we haven't, I mean, apart from the whole fact that it's 180 degrees from what the Constitution says, we could possibly agree on this goal. But there's so many loopholes here, it's, it's almost hard to know where to begin criticizing it, right? So for one thing, not yet. I'm not sure. Okay. So provide doesn't mean produce, okay? So if we want to give people heating oil, we don't set up state refineries. If we want to give people food, we don't set up state-run farms. If we want to give people health care, we don't set up state-run hospitals. We give people money, and then they go buy the things that they need. Um, why don't we do that with education? What, why is it different? So, educable child, that's a great word, because that word is defined nowhere, okay? It's mentioned in Claremont. It is not defined in any RSA. It's not defined in any ed rule. It's not defined in any other court decision, okay? So what does it mean? Who the hell knows, right? But there is some normal meaning, which hasn't been you know, twisted yet, which is basically you look at somebody and say, some kids are not really capable of being taught certain things, okay? And so that's an opening, it's a huge opening for actually saying, you know what, we're only gonna focus on educable kids. And we're not gonna worry so much about the ones who aren't. Well, maybe there's some other way to take care of them, but education is not actually what the state's responsibility is in that case. So, uh, in addition, if you have a computer and an internet connection, as I've already mentioned, you already have the opportunity to acquire any knowledge that exists, including this knowledge, right? So in that sense, all you need to do is give every kid a laptop and an internet connection, and we could cut our property taxes by a factor of 10, okay? Why are we not doing that? Um, and if the requirement, that my favorite one is the use of the word necessary, which I think we really ought to be hammering on as a substitute for adequate. Because adequacy is sort of a judgment. This is a justification, necessary. And here's the interesting thing. If the requirement is we have to provide the opportunity to get knowledge that's necessary to participate in government and as a citizen, then any knowledge or learning that isn't required to be mastered by everybody clearly isn't necessary. And there's no reason why the state should be paying for it, okay? Is it necessary for people to be able to read and write and understand statistical arguments in order to participate in government and as citizens? Yeah, it is. Is it necessary for people to be able to play the trombone? Not so much. Speak French? No. Get a fastball? Not really. Um, do plumbing or welding or CNC machining? Not, not so much, okay? And so, you know, it, it raises a question which is never asked, which is why are taxpayers paying for these things, right? It's one thing to, to pay so that people can learn to communicate clearly and understand how they're being jerked around, right? It's quite another thing to say, yeah, oh, there's also, ne right next to the, in the Constitution, right next to that right to an education, we also find a right to job training, right? It, it's, it's not there, and I don't even think the court would say it's there if you asked them, which I'm sure somebody will. Um, and even more fun. The legislature, on the other hand, says not just that you have to provide an opportunity, it says you have to provide the actual education, right? And it doesn't mention educable children anymore. So you have to do this for all children, which is sort of like saying you guys have to suspend gravity on Fridays, right? It's not something you can do. You can't educate uneducable children by definition and even educable children, as we all have heard, you can't, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make him drink, okay? You cannot make a kid learn if he's not interested in learning. So right now, you guys, as school, school board members, are basically getting conflicting directing, um, directives from three different authorities, the Constitution, the court, the legislature. So what are you supposed to do? Who are you supposed to listen to, okay? That's a serious question that requires some serious discussion that it's not getting currently. And we haven't even heard from the executive branch yet, right? <laughs> Who will come in and say, oh, we think it's something different. So there are two ways to look at this. One is that this is a big problem, okay? And it looks like a problem. 
But maybe it's an opportunity. Okay? So what do I mean by that? Here's an example of a typical RSA. We don't have to read the whole thing. Basically, it's about robbery. And it does what you would want an RSA to do. It defines a, a thing that's wrong, it defines an offense, and then it specifies a punishment. Okay, that seems pretty clear. <coughs> Compare that with this. So this is White Cane Safety Day. Every year the governor shall take suitable public notice, blah, 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 he will issue a proclamation. You know what, he didn't do it this year. And as far as I know, he didn't do it last year. And as far as I know, nobody's ever done it. And here's the thing, did, did he get arrested? Did he have to pay a fine? Was he punished in any way? No, he was not. And that's because if you read it, there is no consequence for not doing this, okay? So there's a word to describe, and this is an RSA. This is not just you know some something posted on this government website, like, yeah, this would be a good idea. This is an RSA. Somebody passed this and called it a statute. And there's a word to describe, a law, that has no consequences if you ignore it, and that word is suggestion, okay? So, in fact, a large part of the New Hampshire RSAs are suggestions. There is no consequence that is specified for breaking those. So here's a quiz. Um, is this a law or a suggestion? I think this is a suggestion, and so, the thing you have to ask yourself if you're a school board member is what if we don't do it? Do we get the same punishment as the governor? You know? Um, which is to say none at all. So what if a school board decided we're going to go four days a week or we're going to do 120 days or we're going to have school on alternate Fridays because that's really all we need for certain grades. Are the state police going to come and arrest you? There is no consequence for doing this. Frank will probably disagree a little bit but um, to immunize against what I think he's going to want to say. He'll say, well, there are these other rules that we could bring in, but those rules have no consequence either. So you have to be able to trace it back to somebody, something where it says, okay, we can actually make you pay us some money or put you in jail. Um, so here's another one, which is, so is this a suggestion or a law? Okay, well, this is a suggestion, but I love this one because it actually has the power Within it, the, as, as uh, Jefferson might have said, it contains the seeds of dissolution for the entire school system. And that is, a school board can give a diploma to anybody at any time, right? There is nothing to stop you from doing that. There's no consequence for doing that. And as soon as you give somebody a diploma, your obligation to him ends at that moment. Okay, now there are four applications that occur to me. You may think of uh, some on your own. You got really disruptive students, students who just will not do what they're supposed to be doing and they're destroying the experience for everybody else. Here's a diploma, thanks, thanks for playing. Um, students who are not educable, <laughs> but on whom you're spending tens or hundreds of thousand dollars, give them a diploma, right? Advanced students, and by that I mean students who are just running out the clock. They've already learned everything they need to know to be effective citizens, and now they're like, well, I'm here, and you've got me here, and I'm trapped, so you have to give me AP courses, you have to let me go to community college, or you have to let me go get a work-study job and, and learn to be a plumber or a CNC machiner or something, right? You could give those guys diplomas. It's like, great, go ahead, go live your life. Um, and there are lots of students who actually could pass a GED, but who are prevented because they're not 16 yet. Okay, give them a test. If they pass it, it's like, that's the equivalent. Here's your diploma. Go live your life, right? And make us not pay 15 or 20 or $25,000 a year to keep you housed in a place that actually prevents you from learning. So you could do this, right? This is something school boards could do. Now, suppose a school board did it, right? I haven't found one yet willing to do it. I'm working on it. Maybe some of you here could help me with this. Now suppose somebody did this and they got challenged and people came forward and said, you can't do this because those kids are not prepared. They haven't met the requirements. And you'd be like, awesome. Let's have that discussion. Okay, because as I believe Frank will probably mention, we have a graduation rate which is north of 90%. But we have a proficiency rate that's around 40%. And so can you imagine what would happen if actual penalties, fines and jail time, were being assessed to people participating in the school system for failing to educate students? The difference between 40% and 90%, that's a lot of penalties waiting to be handed out, right? 
And if those were being assessed, who would, who would run for school board? You'd be crazy. Who would take a job as a school administrator or possibly a teacher? You'd be out of your mind, okay? And what this tells us is, the picture is just as a if somebody did challenge this, the whole thing comes down, right? The whole system just blows up. But what this tells us is the system, whether it's by design or by accident, cannot operate with any real accountability. It can't. As soon as you stick accountability into there, the whole thing blows up, okay? We don't agree on what we're supposed to be doing, and we have no way of making anybody do it, right? And that sounds like a recipe for what? Well, pretty much what we have, right? So what we have instead, instead of actual accountability, is we have intimidation, right? So we have the courts pushing the legislature around, and we have the legislature pushing the Department of Education around, and we have the Department of Education pushing school boards around, school boards pushing administrators around, although that often happens in the other direction. We have administrators pushing teachers around, we have teachers pushing students around, we have students pushing each other around. It's just bullying all the way down, right? So what is the official advice on handling bullying? Well, we actually, Jody and I were look, trying to look at anti-bullying policies all around the state, and most of them just amount to, if you reduce them to what they say, it's like, we're against it. Okay, that, that's the official anti-bullying policy. We, we don't like it. Crop TV.